We are presenting as part of the PATHS project, and PATHS stands for Providing Accessible Training and Home Supports for Parents with ID. And this project is focusing on supporting home visitors from different um, programs around the state of Arizona um, in their service of families and especially of parents with um, intellectual disabilities. Welcome, everybody. Um, this is actually a program from the Institute for Human Development at Northern Arizona University. So we'd like to thank our colleagues and our support from the IHD. Um, we'd also like to thank the, our funder, who is the Arizona Developmental Disabilities Planning Council. Um, they were the entity that provided us the, the grant to do this type of work. So we're really grateful to them. We'd also like to, we had two advisory boards to help guide us with this project and, and the information that we're sharing with you today. The first um, is our parent advisory board. It was made up of four parents who identify as having intellectual disabilities and they really helped us um, with our narrative and, and our information and, and making sure that we're upholding their voices and remembering um, to honor their lived experiences. Our other advisory board were a group of home visiting supervisors. So um, I know Irma Marquez is on the call. So thanks to her, she was one of them. Um, and then we've we've done quite a number of interviews with home visitors from around the state. And so we certainly um, have taken the, the information they've shared and the stories and experiences that um, they were uh, they, they helped us understand and incorporated all of that information into these trainings as well. And just to plug, we're still looking for a few home visitors to do interviews with. Um, so if you're interested, please contact me. My email is at the bottom of the slides. Um, I'd love to, to chat with you. And there is um, a $25 gift card um, as a thank you. So um, please consider that as you go through the um the project today the presentation um let's move on we're going to introduce ourselves so um our paths team is made up of an interdisciplinary team here from the institute from Hum for human development uh, my name is sarah clancy and i have a background in occupational therapy i've worked in early intervention doing home-based work for the um for a long time throughout Northern Arizona. And I've had the pleasure of working with many different home visiting programs as well. I, I provide services for AZIP. So I'm really excited to, to get to reach out and, and to work with um, home visiting programs. So Erica, do you wanna go next? Sure. Hi, my name is Erica Kapizi. Uh, my background is in social work. Um, I also work here though at NAU at the Institute for Human Development. Um, I have a lot of uh, background in doing a lot of homework with families, um, children and parents, um, and also work um, for the Navajo Nation Early Intervention Team here in Flagstaff. And we're also joined today by Michelle Lee and Greta Cruiser and Maggie Brockman um, and, and Miles McDonald, who will be our technical assistants today providing our technical assistance. So um, later on in what we'll do today is a didactic training for the first half, kind of talking about the individualization of care for parents with ID, and then we'll do a case study. And um, after the case study break into some small groups. So you'll meet one of our team members in your group today. So um, before moving on, I want to remind everybody that during the case study, um, it is a real case. We've changed the names to protect confidentiality, but if it's somebody that you you know, please um, be respectful of their, their confidentiality. Um, and also, um, if anybody has questions along the way or wants to make comments, please either come off of mute or share them in the chat. We have a really great group today, so I'm excited to see um, and learn from all of you as well. And with that... <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Hi, everyone. So 
Our learning objectives for today, we've got two of them. So if we do our job kind of at the end of this training, you should be able to answer these two questions. First is uh, describe strategies for identifying needs of parents with ID. And second, describe some of the challenges parents with ID have with learning. Okay. And so I'll do it like a little quick kind of recap of training one uh, for anyone who, who wasn't there, just um, a little bit of a reminder. And we, is anybody actually on our team able to put the link to our website in the chat? Um, because that training is now on our website, uh, the training one, both the, the PowerPoint slides and the actual training uh, for viewing for anyone who wasn't able to be there or wants to see it again. Um, <clears throat> so I'll go ahead and read each of these points. Um, the training number one was titled Awareness and Basic Knowledge of ID. So a lot of information about what ID is and is not. And these are kind of the main takeaways. So individuals with ID have challenges in both the intellectual and adaptive functions of daily life. Uh, parents with ID have historically been and continue to be unfairly targeted by the child welfare system. So in other words, uh, parents with ID are getting reported um, and having children removed from their home when there's not a safety issue present. Um, the reporting and, and sometimes removal is occurring simply because of the disability. So we're trying to bring some awareness to that. Uh, that problem. Uh, ID can be used as grounds for termination of parental rights in the state of Arizona. And um, in our last training, there was a map with a link to the map of all the states in, in the United States and what their laws are around that. Uh, people with ID are able to parent, love, and care for their children, just like parents without ID. Uh, many will need the support of family and friends, but everyone's different. And I just want to uh, make a quick point there that when a parent with a disability requires the support of family and or friends or both, um, that in itself is, is never a child safety issue. All parents need support um, and it's perfectly fine to, to have your life set up in that fashion. Uh, let's see. Um, parents with ID are able to learn new skills just like people without ID. Um, it may, just may take a little bit longer or require extra support. Parents with ID often feel judged by professionals and will therefore avoid interactions with professionals. That could include home visiting. It could include pediatrician appointments, um, but an avoidance of, of all of those interactions for fear of judgment and child welfare, um, unnecessary child welfare reporting. Uh, next slide. So um, we're really excited today. We have um, a parent with us, a guest speaker. Her name's Kiana Mayo. She's a parent and a grandparent um, uh, living with ID who um, is here to, to join and be part of our conversation and teach us all um, a lot. We're really excited to have her here. And um, this Nothing About Us Without Us, we talked about this at the last session, but I wanted to put it in there again because it's really important. And this is a link. So if you... Um, go back to these slides later on our website. You can click on this link. It'll go to the International Disability Alliance. But Nothing About Us Without Us is a slogan that came to use um, in the world of disability activism in the 90s. And it's basically saying that no policy should be created um, or decided by a representative without the full participation of those affected by the policy. And that goes for research as well, which is why we've got Kiana and our other parents working with us throughout this. So. Excited to introduce her. Um, so Kiana, if you um, are comfortable, go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi, my name is Kiana Mayo and I'm 48 years old and I'm a parent with intellectual disability disorder, which I also have children that have intellectual disability disorder. And um, right now I'm raising my grandchildren that have the same disorders. And um. I want to say that we're all human at the end of the day. We're, in, we're no different than no one else. So when you hear the word intellectual disability disorder, it's not for you to think that, you know, um, we're kids because we're not kids. Like I said, when I started out, I'm a parent that have kids. 
and I also have grandchildren that I'm raising. And um, with my story is like um, growing up, it was like in school systems because the school systems did not have things that they're having now, more advanced now back then. So I was always in special ed. I was always sat in special ed or my mom was caught. So that means she had to take home. She had to take out of work, be off work for her to come and get me from school because of the school system was not able, capable of taking care of me. And it's probably, I probably wasn't the only child that was in that class with intellectual disability disorder. It probably was a bunch of us, but they felt as though we were acting out, which we weren't acting out. It was just a space of where I just felt like then they judged us. And I feel like that still to this day, that we're being judged and we're being discriminated on with having a disability. And having a disability, it can be visible or it can be invisible. We just want to be treated fairly because we're human. And it's like dealing with the system as far as welfare departments and things like that. It is like, it's scary because, you know, as soon as you think of DCF or child welfare department coming to your home, you feel threatened. You feel unsafe. You feel you want to shut down. You want to isolate. And... I'm not just the parent, I'm not just a grandparent, I'm a mother and I'm also an advocate because if my voice, if another person's voice cannot be heard, I'm there to open up and let the world know that we, we are here. You didn't hear us back then, but we're here now. And that's what I wanna say. And if anyone have any questions or anything, I'm here. Thank you, Kiana. And yeah, we're going to go through like a few more slides. And then at the end of that, we can open up for questions too for anything that comes up. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Next slide, Sarah. Thank you. So, um, so the topic of this training is uh, individualization of care. Um, our research, which included interviews with home visitors, supervisors, parents, a literature review, um, showed that individual individualization of care when it comes to accommodating a parent with ID is going to be the most important piece. Um, and in order to individualize care, we have to first get to know someone really well and learn what their needs are. So um, next one. So <clears throat> we kind of broke this um, this up into two categories when it comes to identification of needs. So the first category is uh, prioritize the relationship, which we did talk about um, at the end of our last training. Um, and before I read these points, I just want to say that, you know, when it comes to identifying somebody's needs, of course, we can always ask, you know, what do you need? Um, and, and that can be a really important thing to do. But for a lot of reasons, uh, this can be a really difficult question to answer, um, not just for parents with ID. For a lot of people, there are a lot of confounding factors that, that make it hard for somebody to know or, or access um, what their needs are to verbalize them. And, and that can be particularly challenging uh, for a parent who might struggle with language um, or processing. So, so there's some other ways to kind of get to know somebody and figure out what their needs are so that you can meet them. Um, so here we've got um, treat everyone in the room as equals and find common ground. Um, and, and many of us in this work are also parents um, or love a child. Um, and so finding common ground in that way can be really easy, but there are so many other ways as well. Um, build trust and rapport, um, you know, and that can take a long time. That can be, that can be a long game for, for a lot of people. And Anyone who goes into the field of, of therapy or social work learns that um, it often takes several sessions, um, even, you know, just in a one on one with somebody to be able to build that trust and rapport and that you can't do much um, before that happens. That kind of has to come first. Um, assume competence. So 
go into it assuming somebody knows exactly what they're doing. They're they're parenting just fine and they they're they're doing okay and maybe they need a little extra support. And if that ends up not being the case, then that's okay too, and we can work with that. But start by assuming um, that somebody knows their kids and knows what their knows what their children need um, in order to thrive and be healthy. Um, also address all of a parent's concerns first. So that's part of building trust and rapport is, is really hearing somebody, what are your concerns? Have you ever been involved in a program like this? Has, have you had somebody come to your home before? How does this feel, you know, and, and start working with that and make sure anything, they feel comfortable kind of verbalizing what um, their concerns might be about getting involved with the program. And then, of course, be patient. Um, it sounds simple, but it's unfortunately not. Um, being patient can be really a hard thing for us to do as humans, um, but incredibly important in, in all the interviews we've had with the parents on our advisory board. Um, being patient just came up over and over and over again. Please be patient with us. And that tells us that, that parents feel like people aren't being patient with them if it's coming up so much. So we want to really point that out as much as possible. Okay, next slide. So the second category, um, when it comes to identifying needs, uh, we put in under communication and observation. So um, that can start with establishing what the preferences are for communication. Um, things like, you know, when we're in person, also when we're not together in person, do you prefer text? Do you prefer call? You know, what does that look like for you? How does it work best for you? And when you can get a handle on that, communication can just be so much smoother um, afterwards. And it can it might mean like check-ins more than once a week, um, kind of quick check-ins over text or things like that. So um, that's really important. Also to utilize active listening. And <clears throat> if you if you were to Google active listening, you get like a gazillion different things about it. Um, it's not an evidence-based practice or a therapeutic approach necessarily, but it, it kind of informs a lot of those and active listening is a really important part of, of any therapist's work um, or anybody working kind of in the human industries. So there's a little uh, link there that that I, I feel like is a good one that really kind of gets out what the point is. Um, but some of the main principles of that are like, you know, seeking to understand before seeking to be understood, um, being non-judgmental, um, give your individual attention to the speaker, use silence effectively, which is, um, you know, all of these things seem intuitive, but as humans, they're just hard for us. <laughs> I think we know they're important, but they're really hard to do, and they take a lot of practice. So the more we do them, the more it kind of becomes natural, and we can um, kind of do it without having to work so hard at it. And then... Um, Oh, taking extra time to learn about the family dynamics and other informal supports. You'll find that parents with ID don't have a lot of formal supports, if any, in place um, because mostly they don't exist, unfortunately. Um, so, so they're getting their support from their family, from their friends, from their neighbors, from a church, um, and really understanding how those relationships are important, how they play into the, the life of the parent and the life of the child. Um, uh, and that'll help with building rapport as well as getting to know all of that. Um, also ask um, the parent about their childhood um, and school experiences. Um, this can be a way of really getting to know what's going on with the parent, what they've been through. Often, um, like Kiana kind of mentioned, parents with ID had a really rough time as a, as a child, um, particularly, um, you know, ones who, who were growing up at a time when when there weren't a lot in schools to support them. And sometimes we see that those supports are still not exactly what children need. So um, getting to know them on that level is really important. And of course, being patient. And um, Kiana, are you, would you mind telling us a little bit about the piece um, and how it was, I know you talked a little bit um, about it earlier, but is there anything more about the school and childhood experiences? Um, yes. I, I also didn't, I knew I would forget. I didn't stop to ask you at the last <laughs> slide too, if there was anything from that previous slide that you wanted. Um, to yes, it was something from the previous. Okay. Uh, the previous I apologize. Go ahead. Um, it was the. I think it was the. 
yeah, build trust and rapper. Um, that okay. part. Um, you know, when you're coming in someone's home, it's like you're not just getting to know the person that you're seeing. You're also got to get to know the whole family because it's a whole as a family. So um with that, you don't just talk to that person, you get to know, interact mostly with the whole family, everybody in the family for them to feel safe as far as people coming in the home. Cause like I said, with child welfare and then um, with the home visitors, you don't know where they're coming from. So you don't feel safe right then and there when they come to your door, you don't want them to come like they're supervising you. You want to feel like you want to welcome them like they're um, family. And um, as far as with the be patient, you have to be patient. If you don't have no patience, this is not the job for you because you have to have patience. That's it on that part. And the part about the school, school and the childhood, the school was, it was just... I can't even, it's not, it's unexplainable as far as the school and you don't want to feel as though you different. Like you want to be able to be in public schools with other kids. It's like with the teachers and things, they're, they're not trained and equipped for um, dealing with people with IDD or any other disability. They're not equipped with dealing with them in the school system and myself as I was growing up, like I said, in the school system, um, I, how are you sending me home all the time? My mom have to come get me. I'm not learning. So that causes a barrier for me with my learning disability that stopped me from learning what I was supposed to learn because I'm home. So it's more like now it seems like my mom have to take off from work to homeschool me, which she didn't. And I just kept missing days of school. So um, I missed a lot of what I should have learned then, then the stuff that I'm learning now as I'm older, because I'm 48 years old. So I I had to, and then after that, I had to raise my own kids. And it would seem like it got a little better with when I started raising my own kids. But then that's when my, my intellectual disabilities weighed in more on me, but I had I had family support when it came to raising my kids. I had family support, and with the the with the preschool system with them, it was different. It was different, but they had a little patience. They wasn't quick to call child welfare, like if I was home and I didn't have to go back to get my kid until maybe two o'clock and I ran over because I, I get home and I, and I feel like I'm doing stuff like folding clothes or um doing dishes or things like that and I, I forget and run over time and forget that I have to go pick my child up they wasn't the system wasn't that bad as quick to um call child welfare um when I was raising my kids, but it was, it was, it's not an easy task. It, it wasn't easy at all. It was like reliving my childhood with raising my kids. And, um, it's not easy. It's just, you, I say here it is again, is you have to have patience. You have to have patience because if you don't have patience, you get, you get some people that will just come in and judge you and I just don't think that that's right, that you shouldn't be in this business if you don't have patience, if you're not kind, caring. This is not this is not um, a job for you. I hear you. Thank you, Kiana. And I was just thinking too that for, for you and for so many parents um, with AD who struggled um, in school for all the reasons you just mentioned with being Call, you're having your mom called all the time and things that I would imagine that that, that would make a parent double down even more on being very, very protective of their own children um, and have having had that experience and wanting to keep them even closer and maybe even keep other people out more 
and just goes to show how much more work it can be on a provider to get to know a parent comfortably who's been through all of that. Yes, because with provi with providers, you're you, you're very skeptical about providers when it when it comes to your own kid because you know what you've been through and you know how pro some providers are quick to call authority when they're not they're not trained properly to deal with people that have intellectual disabilities any kind of disabilities is the point of you you don't want to feel like you're different so um you just want them to make you feel safe and you want to be able to open up and and, and talk with them it's just you 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 have when it comes to the authority they take authority the wrong way absolutely yeah thank you and that feeling safe is a really important piece thanks for mentioning that okay next slide so um why does indivis in <laughs> struggling with that word today why does individualization of care matter um, this is kind of a wordy slide now that I'm looking at it. I apologize, but um, I really liked this first um, quote from a research article um, that I'll go ahead and read. Many of the correlates associated with worse outcomes for children of parents with intellectual disabilities can be attributed to social and environmental factors that stem from a lack of support and resources. So in other words, if a child has um, a negative outcome, if that child has a parent with ID and they have a negative outcome, that is much, much more likely to be related to the way they've been uncared for by society, kind of pushed out, disenfranchised, not being provided with the resources they need and access to what resources do exist. Um, and then in addition to that, um, I underline this because it's really important and we'll talk about it more in the next training, but formal and professional resources for parents with ID are extremely limited and in most cases, non-existent. Um, so it really is um, comes down to the informal resources that we've talked a little bit about. There's reduced help seeking and low engagement among parents with ID in maternal and child health services. So. Um, <clears throat> parents with ID, for all the reasons we've discussed, are reluctant to seek out help or maybe not know where to get it. Um, and so they're kind of at a disadvantage from the very beginning, even early on in pregnancy through no fault of their own. Uh, last, comprehensive relationship-based interventions um, uh, are needed to support parenting and promote parent and child health and well-being among families headed by a parent with ID. So it all comes back to that relationship again and the trust and the rapport and all the things we've talked about. Next slide. This slide was in our last training, um, but this is kind of um, um, another reason why individualization of care matters. Um, every person and parent with ID is unique, just like every parent is unique. Um, there's no difference there. So I'll go ahead and read the quote. Um, uh, from the Brandeis uh, School for Social Policy. Though all people with intellectual disabilities share the diagnostic criteria for slower learning, longer processing time, and increased support needs in daily life, each person's skills and interests are unique. Some parents struggle with making appointments, while others may need help knowing how to respond to a baby's cries more than they do keeping appointments. Needs very widely, and the only way to be effective in supporting these parents is to learn what their individual needs are. Um, okay, so let's move on to the next section. Of, um... Are you able to move that slide, Sarah? Thank you. So we've got four... Um, Four common challenges that parents with ID face. Uh, not all of them have all four. Um, again, they're all everybody's different. Um, but we're just going to go through some of the the four most common ones, and then um, like a little example of what that might look like in daily life for a parent. And then break out real, well, not break out, but go to like a Google Jamboard real quick, and we can all kind of share some some thoughts and ideas and questions, and and Kiana can. Um, and help us with that as well. Uh, so the four are uh, difficulty generalizing learned information, 
slower processing or responding, difficulty with thinking ahead and planning, and difficulty with self-direction and internal motivation. Um, so next slide, we'll go to, the, we'll start at the first one, which is <clears throat> difficulty generalizing learned information. And in orange under each of these, you'll see what the possible um, way this could be viewed by the rest of the world, by society, by others, um, without understanding. If somebody has difficulty generalizing learned information, in other words, transferring it into different situations, um, it can look like a problem with memory when in fact it, it's something else entirely. So here's our little example. Um, a home visitor is helping a parent use modeling language with their child while playing with blocks. And in, in the home, we'll say this is in the home. Uh, the parent learns the skill and successfully uses it with their child whenever they play with blocks at home. Um, when playing in the sandbox at the park, the parent struggles to use the same skill to model language. And so to a home visitor or a provider, it might look like, oh, you don't remember how to do that. We need to learn it again. And in fact, that's not the case. It's that that skill wasn't able to be transferred to this new environment. And so they just need a different way to be taught it. Um, so um, I also want to say real quick that difficulty generalizing learned information can also be seen in people with autism. So a lot of these things, you know, you're gonna see in all kinds of people, um, not just with ID, and it, it can look different um, for everybody. Um, and let's see, Kiana, do you have anything you want to say about that before we do the, go to the little shared Jamboard? Um, yes, can you go back to the um, previous slide? Sure. Yeah. Um, with the slowing process of responding, um, I dealt with that slower processing and responding. Um, like someone will say, call me, call me, just call me. You can't just say call you because I'll be calling you all day. You have to specifically say, call me at this time. And um, with the slower processing, and responding, I um, it's like a memory thing for me because I have that I, I forget, and I know because I have a lot of I have to put a lot of sticky notes around the place, and um, for appointments and things like that, and, and more like, you know, when you read stuff, um, I have to have someone read it and then I have to look over it again to like better process what I'm understand what I'm um reading and for it. So it like take longer for me to process. It's not really long, it's like slower, like um like she just she Erica just read it before the slide before. I had to come back and need to read it again to understand the process of everything. So it's like a little, I'll say a little slower, but it's not like um, like real slow, like a baby. Like, it don't, uh, don't treat me like a baby. You, you just have to understand. And also with um, difficulty with thinking ahead and planning, I have that bad, like I just said, with the sticky notes and, um, and my phone making appointments and keeping it because if not I forget I won't even remember and um thinking ahead and planning I can't like um if my appointment is Friday I gotta do start I have to really start like Tuesday Wednesday making sure every day I can't just be like on Thursday and no an appointment Friday it'd be a disaster so it's like um I, it takes me, I have to do it uh, way ahead of time than my appointment being on Friday and I'm just going to do it on Thursday because I be done already had a whole bunch of things going on already within my head that um, I had to start a couple of days earlier than that with the thinking ahead and planning. I can't just plan like, okay, I'm just, my appointment Friday, I'll just do this um, Thursday night. No, 
it won't be done. I have to make sure everything, if I have a doctor's appointment, I have everything written down for the doctor, everything and everything. I will have to do that like maybe like three days ahead of time. That's it. Gotcha. Thank you. And and people with um adults with ADHD can struggle with with the same thing. So so many of these are, you know, learning how to accommodate some of these challenges are just good human skills in general, right? Because a lot of people for different reasons um, can have, can struggle. Um, so thank you, Kiana. So should we do the um, jam board real quick, Sarah? Try. Okay, so bear with us because um, this is our first time using Jamboard. Um, well, sorry, it's mine. Maybe other people have. Um, so we want to just have you guys, um, any like thoughts, ideas, strategies you have about the difficulty with generalizing learned information, life hacks or whatever, any, anything that comes to mind, something that you've seen a parent do successfully, um, or that you've, that you learned somewhere else that's been effective or helpful, um, these are the kind of things we want to have in our toolbox when we go into a home to, to help a parent. So, um, I think Sarah's going to post that or share that um, Jamboard in a second. And you'll just click on the link and then, um, there we go. So in the, ch everyone needs to click on the, when you share the link in the chat, right, Sarah? So we'd like you to share strategies on helping parents generalize information on this one. Um, anything you can think of from um, ways to, you know, help them use their phone in different, you know, capacities or apps or um, things you can leave behind in your visits. So what, whatever comes to mind, just um, in seeing model different settings with toys and dolls, right? How do, how do we help support that um, generalization, generalization and use of skills in different situations? meet with the home visitor in different situations. Right. Wait for a few more. So here's the sticky note. If you have an idea, please feel free. Be flexible, that's right. Read to the parent and summarize what was being said, meet in different environments, discuss different scenarios. Thank you all. These are all coming from different people. So I appreciate everybody jumping in. All right, visual aids and charts. Use the same game, model parents. Use the same game in a variety of settings practice skills in multiple settings. So you're really getting it. We want to help generalize by practicing that with parents. So great ideas. We're going to move on. Oh, there's one more. Let's see, I have to make this bigger for myself. <laughs> Talk in an easy language, present information in more than one way and in more than one session, make a calendar and help with organization, help the... Uh, organize it with the parent. Great. Get them involved. Repeat the activities or skills. That repetition can be very valuable for all of us. These are wonderful ideas. So Erica, what I think we'll do is go on to the next few, follow the child's leads. Yeah. Kind of help the parent understand what the, the child's interests are and play along with the child. Um, it's 1240. Oh, two. So, um, I think we can go through the, the rest of the slides without maybe breaking up. We have such great ideas, but, mm -hmm. um, we're going to need to get to the 
the case study in a, just a couple of minutes. So Erica, do you wanna um, continue sharing? Let me get this back up. Yeah. And I will get into presentation mode. There we go. And I'm going to move us. Um, okay. All right, Erica. Okay. Um, oops, sorry, let me. Okay. Okay, so. The next one um, <clears throat> is slower processing or responding, and Keanu was just talking a bit about that. The way that can be viewed by people is that they're feeling ignored or dismissed. It may look like the question is not understood or heard. Um, and it should be noted that there are people, you know, without ID um, who just generally have slower processing. It's just part of part of who they are. Um, so the example is a home visitor asks a parent a question about their child's development. For example, when did your child start rolling over and the parent does not respond for a while or looks away? Um, that, that likely means that they need a little bit of time to think about it, to kind of go through the question in their head. Also recalling when your child did something can be really hard <laughs> um, for parents in general. Um, so, you know, just understanding understanding that and, and being able to relate to that. Um, so some strategies here could be um, um, uh, just waiting, you know, getting comfortable with that silence like we talked about, that can be really important. Silence isn't, doesn't mean anything's wrong or bad. Um, you can just wait, um, offer to repeat the question if they need it, um, things like that, or, or just ask, like, can I, is, are, is there a different way I can ask you the question? Would it be helpful if I wrote it down also? and we can read it together. Sometimes being able to read something while you're also hearing it can be helpful for a lot of people. Um, and then, <clears throat> difficulty with thinking and planning ahead. Um, this can look like laziness, lack of interest, lack of care, um, <clears throat> which it's not, it's just a challenge. So. Example here is a parent of an infant consistently runs out of formula before her next grocery store trip. Um, when this happens, she calls a family member for the help for help at the last minute to get the formula. And I just want to, to say too here that um, this is, I mean, this isn't in itself a problem, right? If a parent calls for help when something isn't going right, that's great. Like that's what we all do. We all forget stuff, we all make mistakes, we all show up somewhere with no diapers or no formula occasionally. It does happen, um, that's not a child safety issue. What's happening here is it's a kind of a consistent pattern that um, the ability to plan the amount of formula that's needed is, is, is hard and that can be hard for anybody given how much babies grow um, and how quickly they change in their eating needs. So the, the point here would be we wanna help empower this parent to like to have to take control over that or or to have to get herself in a situation where she doesn't have to feel bad about herself or frustrated that she has to ask for help at the last minute when we could kind of strategize ways to to get ahead of that right so it's it's not about a safety issue in this particular example it's it's um a way of of just helping a parent plan and, and get get better at learning how to do that okay and next uh, <clears throat> difficulty with self-direction and internal motivation. Um, again, this can look like laziness or lack of care, interest. We're very quick to go there as humans to think of people as lazy or not caring or not interested. Very often there's something else going on. So um, it's a good strategy to not have that be our first go-to, particularly with, particularly with parents. Um, so an example here is that a parent misses parent misses a pediatrician appointment for the child, despite a reminder phone call from the doctor's office two days prior. So you know often doctors' offices do that; they um, they call ahead of time, they text, they do different things, they email. But maybe that's just not quite enough. Maybe there needs to, or that's not the right type of strategy for this particular parent, and they need um, something else. They need the sticky notes, like Kiana said, or a calendar or an app. Um, that, that rings more frequently um, at leading up to the appointment, uh, things of that nature. So there's a lot of strategies that can be put into place there. Um, so 
Kiana, we're going to, uh, let's see. Oh, gosh. We're going to move on to the case study soon. But did you have anything you wanted to say about any of those before we move on? Um, yeah, um, um, basically it's, um, plain language mm -hmm. that is more, that is very, very important plain language mm -hmm. when you're, um, coming into a home, no big words and, um, stuff that you, it, it, some of the stuff you can't understand, like when you go to the doctor's office and they're using those big acronyms and things like that, no, um, basically plain language. Yeah, thank you for bringing that up. And we we touched on that a little bit in our last training, and we're going to talk more about it in the next one. And today, actually, Kiana sent me a couple of really great videos on plain language that um, I'm going to use in our next uh, training to help people learn how to use um, plain language. So thank you. Yeah. Um, okay. And then does um, anyone have uh, questions for Kiana? Anything that's come up that you'd like to... Put either put in the chat or unmute yourself and ask. Gus, I think a, a small, quiet group today. Kiana, what's the main the like? If you could pick one thing that you want home visitors to take away, um, or to know, um about parents with ID. Could you pick one thing? Is there like one thing that sticks out? One thing, well, um, yeah. We're human. Don't come in act, don't come in feeling as feeling as though that um you have to treat us like babies. Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you for being honest. That's how we that's how we get better. Um, okay, so we've got a case study, and I think we're going to go ahead and not do the breakout rooms this time because we are running short on time, <laughs> and we want to make sure everyone can finish on time because you probably have places to be and things to do. So um, we're going to go ahead and do the case study, but we'll just not do breakout rooms. We can um, maybe just put some ideas in the chat instead. So I'll go ahead and read it. Um, the same. This is the same case study we had last time for our first session. Um, we just have a different question to go with it uh, today. So uh, Henry, Eileen, and family. Henry is a two and a half year old little boy who lives with his mother, Eileen, who's 36, and extended family members. He does not have any siblings. Henry was referred to an early intervention program at age two months when the physician identified feeding concerns in Henry. The physician also had concerns that Eileen was struggling to understand his feeding needs, which can be complicated for, for uh, complex babies. Henry was enrolled in early intervention and a physical therapist, Lisa, began providing services to the family in their home. As Lisa got to know Henry, Eileen, and the other family members living in the home, Lisa observed that Eileen had difficulty answering many of her questions, often provided only yes and no answers and relied on family members to do a lot of the communicating for her. Family members also seemed eager to be involved in Henry's care and often spoke before Eileen had an opportunity. Genetic testing eventually revealed that Henry and Eileen have the same genetic disorder. Many people with this particular genetic disorder also have intellectual disability. So it's kind of written between the lines here is that um, that Henry and um, Eileen both have ID and the family has um, is part of their world and is is helping them live and thrive. So our question is, how can the extended family members be included so that Eileen gets the support she needs while still having the ability to parent Henry to the best of her ability and have a voice as a mother? Um, because for many parents, um, like Eileen, in this case, um, we want to empower them. We want them to be able to parent their children, and, and they want to parent their children, and they can parent their children, um, but often need some extra support from, from family and friends. Um, and we want to 
have all that work together as best as possible. And it can be, it can be complicated and sensitive and we wanna navigate it um, sensitively um, with a family to figure out how that works best for them. So um, I'm thinking, Kiana, um, first of all, if anyone has any thoughts or ideas, if you could just go ahead and put them in the chat, I think that would be best for now. Um, but Kian, I know that, you know, you mentioned your family um, has lived with you and helped you care for your, for your children. And now you're helping care for your grandchildren. Um, any thoughts you are comfortable sharing with us about, about what that's looked like in your life? Um, yes, I just was saying, I, as you was reading and I was thinking, um, what I was growing up and how I, I was raising my kids, um, they my they was like overprotective and I it, it was like I loved the support but I wanted to do stuff like um be able to care for my kids I wanted to I had my kids I want to take care of my kids I want to do stuff for my kids like everybody else like in the family do what they do so um I didn't want them to feel like I couldn't like get up in the middle of the night or I couldn't make a bottle or um, change diapers and things like that. Like I didn't want them to feel like um, I couldn't do it. I wanted to, cause the only way I'm going to learn is if I do it because when I had a baby, I know I don't think no one came, the kids came with a manual no one so um we have to I had to learn either way and they didn't give me a book when I after I had the baby like here this is what you do with the book and this is the baby and I, no so I had to learn and it was it was a struggle but it was it was a process and it it, it was my life and it's still continuing to be my life now and it's not as um difficult as I thought it was with having as much support because when you have a lot of you know what as not saying don't have support but when you have your family it's like they're very overprotective with you so when you have a child they're very very overprotective because of situations with child welfare system and things like that so the the littlest mistakes they don't want you to you to make the little mistakes that's just like going to the to the doctor's office and if I have support like if my mom go with me to the doctor's office and um the doctor's talking to my mom I'm the parent why are you talking to my mom like I'm not even there like you're just having a whole conversation now um so when it's time for me to get home and I got to take care when I'm uh, I finally get on my own and I had to take care of my child you it's like, okay, but you was talking to my mother and I'm listening, but you still wasn't interacting with me as being the parent. So, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it do you think it would be helpful in, in cases where there's clearly another adult involved in wanting to help, right? Mm -hmm. um, that that doctor or pro whoever the professional is just asks like yeah i think that's the big thing to let's ask just talk this out like who what's what's going on here how can i help who should i focus my questions on and why and just like be real about it yeah because don't just jump to conclusions like you know like i i'm holding a child i have this is my child but you assume it because you're looking at me and you're looking at my support system and you're you're there once again you're um judging you're judging me so yeah you you can't make assumptions gotcha and erica there are some really great chats oh yes thank you um one was offered by erica and she mentioned that offering help with doctor's appointments would might be a good idea and a way to support families um, another one was, ah, I've missed it, but one, um, ask Eileen how she wants her family to help and be a part of the visits, let the parents set the boundaries around the family and their involvement. And, um, Maggie shared that family members can refocus their efforts to what Eileen asks for help with instead of just 
assuming she needs help with everything. Mm. So, awesome ideas. Thank that you. Works. Thank you guys. Thank you, Kiana, for sharing all of your yes. ideas as well. Yeah. Thank um, you. I think we'll move on. We are um, really excited that everybody was here and we had such a great turnout today. Um, our next session will be in two weeks at the same time. It's Monday, the May 20th. Um, Michelle Hatley has put in the chat the survey for this um, training. So please give us, share your ideas and your thoughts with us. It really helps us build trainings around what you would like to see. Um, and then if you have questions, um, I put my email in Erica's email, but I'm like I said, I'm still looking for people to interview. So if you want to reach out to me, I would I would love to hear hear from you and hear your stories. Um, and last but not least, here is the uh, survey as well and the QR code if you just want to take a picture of it with your phone, then that's fine too. But um, I really want to thank Erica today for for leading the discussion and being so thoughtful and and creating. The, the presentation and but most of all thanking Kiana Mayo for for being here with us taking time out of her day to really help us understand her experiences um, as a parent and then of course thanking all of you again for for coming and taking your lunch break or you know time off of a Monday that is probably pretty busy to to hear from us and to gain this knowledge so we can we can all work to better serve um, families with, with parents who have intellectual disabilities. So please stay on if there are extra questions or put things in the chat. If you have thoughts you want to share with us, we'll be here. Um, but again, thank you so much.